Hi, I'm Donovan Ackley, and I am your instructor for uh, Building Bridges, Religions and Spirituality. This is going to be the first lecture that we do, and I have some slides for you. Uh, you'll get a PDF, an access to PDF of the, these slides. Um, so the first lecture I wanted to share with you was just really why even build bridges? I don't know how you feel about this, but... Um, a lot of us who are LGBTQIA+, two-spirit, whatever it might be, um, may have some experiences with religions and religious communities that kind of, maybe we feel bridges have been burned, not by us. Um, so the question of why building bridges can come from having some pretty negative experiences with people who are hostile and aggressive and even violence and threatening to those of us who are LGBTQ, why would we wanna build a bridge to that? Um, another way of looking at it is from the perspective of religious folks, they may, there are maybe some, not all, but some religious folks who feel like building a bridge to LGBTQ plus communities is something that, why would they do that? Those, they may believe that their religions tells, tells them specifically not to do that. So I thought it was important for us to start with, why would we even want to build a bridge? Um, so the first thing I wanted to share was, and I'm kind of assuming I've, kind of, I've shared some of this material before um, at seminaries and community colleges and uh, other settings where not everybody was bought into the idea that, built, that bridges needed to be built. <laughs> Um, so there have been a lot of different learning contexts. Sometimes, like I said, it was a seminary in one case where not everybody was open to LGBTQ inclusion. Um, and another case it was a community college where they were um, just not sure there was any built bridge that could be built between those two communities. As if those are different, there's actually, of course, overlap. But anyway, so what I wanted to share with you, I've had to adapt learning goals. Oh, and the other one that I mentioned here is um, I also, I had this, some of this material that I used when I was training people that answered the phones at Trans Lifeline because a lot of our callers had religious trauma and they were feeling like they might want to end their lives specifically because they were people of faith or the people they loved, their families, their parents, whoever it might be, were people of faith. And they'd internalized a message that who they were wasn't okay or they were in fear. Maybe they were okay with who they were but they really believed, you know, if I come out, um, I'm going to lose everybody I love. So, so our community of people, trans people who were answering the phones for those calls, even if they weren't, which most of them weren't religious folks, but um, they needed a little bit of training about how do I help someone that this is their issue. I may be overtly hostile to religion, but how do I help someone who is trans or a, you know, a sex or gender minority who is struggling with this. So anyway, so that's the learning goals I have for this today. Um, and you know, really in a sense for the whole course are pretty practical. So I wanted to say that, for example, when I was working with the Trans Lifeline uh, community, the gender minority community, giving peer support to, to other gender minority folks in crisis, we found out that religious diversity and spiritual diversity was the thing that people came in with the least training about. Um, most other things, folks that were gender and sex minorities had a lot of knowledge about gender and sex minority issues, but in the area of religion, they had, they were self-reported, this is the area that I really know the least about. Um, so, and like I've already just said, it's already on the slide, but um, this is something that came up a lot, even though most of us didn't have a whole lot of training to deal with it. So a simple learning goal for you today in this class, for example, it, I'm not going to try to change anybody's mind about religion. And I don't also, I don't try to change people's minds unless I'm in a religious setting specifically asked to do it. I don't try to change people's mind about gender and sex minorities anymore because there's a lot of people doing that work in a wonderful way and um, they have the spoons to do it. And I, I don't have the spoons to argue with people who don't want to learn. Um, so if I'm, if I'm talking to you, like I'm talking to you right now, you already have some buy-in and having this conversation. So, so my, um, Again, my goal isn't to argue with you about what you believe. It's just to help you, equip you to have these conversations 
if you need to, if you want to, if someone you love needs you to, um, to be able to equip you with some information that might be helpful. So that's it. I'm not trying to, I have no agenda. I just want to make sure that you have all the information, not all of it, there's too much, but as much information as we can convey and explore together in four weeks um, to help you have these conversations better because they do come up a lot and they cause a lot of harm. Okay, that was very wordy. So um, the main thing, I'm not gonna read everything on the slides, I'm just kind of showing you what's here, but the main things um, that come up in this course that I'm gonna try to address are really two things, tr religious trauma for LGBTQ people and, and why that happens. And then the other thing we're gonna explore a lot more where it's been one week on religious trauma because I'm pretty sure that's in a class like this, that's probably what you come in knowing about and would be expecting to deal with. Um, we're going to dig in deeper and spend more time on the part you might not know as much about or that you, you know, certainly in the wider communities that we've been talking about so far, there's less information on this, but it's on resilience as usual. If you've been taking any other class with me, you know, that's my thing. Um, so we're going to talk about gender and sex minority resilience in terms of religions and spirituality. Anyway, so those are the two uh, topics. Um, these are some, sterling, some learning outcomes for you. You can explore these on your own. They'll be on the syllabus. They'll be in the Moodle website. Uh, so I want to let you know, oh, let me get to the fourth learning outcome though. What we're gonna do in week four, in a lot of ways, these kind of almost line up with the weeks of the course, but my goal in terms of the outcome for you to have a takeaway when you leave this class is for you to actually have a resource guide. I already obviously, you know, with, with what I've shared with you that I've done this course content before in a lot of different settings, including on a suicide hotline, we already ha I already have a resource guide to give you and um, I really look forward to, as we've done in some other classes, being open to what you all have to bring and share with each other um, and with the learning community as a whole so that we can maybe expand on and add and make it even more relevant to have a resource guide that's truly collaborative uh, and relevant to the people that are in the class right now. So that's, that's kind of what that last learning outcome is about and i just want to give you a heads up that's what your final project is is to, to we're going to build this collaborative resource guide starting with something you know i have one already that we can build out but anyway um so i wanted to share with you in terms of building bridges that contemporary u.s christians are deeply divided about the inclusion of same-sex couples or individuals who gen gender transition you already know that um, I'm quoting the scholar here. All these sources are linked um, either on the slide itself, so you can kind of see down there, I give you a link to um, the, the resource I'm citing. There, um, there's also sometimes, anyway, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Any, anything I cite, you've also got a link to, okay? That's all I need to say. Um, but let me just quote her. She says, our cultural commitment to the male-female binary is about the reinforcement of majority rule, tr majority tradition, majority culture, and majority power. And a great deal of that tradition is about Christianity, particularly interpretation of the Bible. Um, so in the second week of the course, well, in, in this week and next week, we're going to look at a couple of those texts that get used in the US disproportionately toward LGBTQ people. In other words, yes, there may be anti-LGBTQ strains in any religion, but in the US, it's Christianity that's used by folks in power and particularly certain interpretations of the Bible and particularly certain interpretations of certain passages um, that are used, they call them clobber passages sometimes. Um, I gave you some examples on this slide of legislation by um, small groups, Christian Family Coalition, Liberty Council, that interpret these particular passages in these particular ways and have it's had legal ramifications to exclude uh, gender minority people um, 
not only from using public restrooms, but it's create, whipped up a public frenzy as if gender minority people going potty is some kind of, you know, sexual predatory activity. It's scared some people. People that don't know any better um, are actually terrified for the safety of their children as in such a way that young trans kids get harassed in schools. So, I mean, I'm not trying to connect a bunch of dots that aren't connected. I'm just trying to say that this inflammatory language about interpreting scriptures of a certain tradition in a certain way has had really wide ramifications that are, you know, have caused violence and threats of violence against gender and sex minorities. So again, that's why we're looking at these. I'm not trying to push a religious agenda. I am very much in favor of separation of church and state. And as much as that's a thing in this country, it, it also isn't, you know what I mean? The, 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 the lines get blurred by certain groups. And right now, a lot of folks are feeling the effects of that. So we're just trying to equip ourselves with knowledge here. Um, one of the things I go through in this slideshow, why are we building bridge bridges? Because no matter how insistent certain religious groups are, the gender variations and, and sexual orientation diversity is something that we choose and it's sin or wrong or disordered or um, whatever whatever words they want to come up for it gender diversity is simply a scientific fact so is so science uh, sexual orientation diversity we're gonna look at gender diversity just because this one uh, uh, it, it's just an example of the you probably already know this but again I'm trying to equip you with with tools you might be able to use in a conversation like this. So if we know that if, if, if a religious community is arguing you're choosing to do this and it's a sin, and you can come back and say, well, in fact, um, we know that one in 2000 people at least are born not male or female. The, and it's the same number of folks that are born with cystic fibrosis, the same number of folks that are born with Down syndrome. It's just a natural variation. Yes, it's a little unusual, but it's no more or less unusual than those conditions. Um, sometimes it happens at birth. Sometimes it's revealed at puberty. Um, but it's it, it lets us know that sex and gender are diverse, right? So um some things i wanted to spend time on in this lecture the ways that sex and gender are defined vary from culture to culture we've studied that in other classes if you've taken some of the other classes in the program they even change within each culture over time so they we know that they don't gender and sex don't express actual innate essential relations between the biological sexes in other words what we think of as male, what we think of as female, what we think of as this is the only way you can do marriage or this is the only way you can do sex. Those things are not innate as in, in terms of being exclusive. They may be innate for some people, but they're, it, they're not, those categories aren't the only innate essential categories, right? So cultural constructions of gender come from social pressures. They don't come from biology. Patterns of gender hierarchy, like patriarchy, for example, like, you know, cisgendered heterosexual men are at the top and, uh, you know, uh, they have more power or more influence or whatever it might be than, than folks, other, other folks. Uh, um, the, so patterns of gender hierarchy symbolize relations between parts of the society that can be collaborative. They don't have to be top down and oppressive. Um, they can be distinctive or they can be a little bit more fluid. There's lots of different ways of patterning societies. Again, if you've been in other classes here, you already know that, that this, this patriarchal system in a heteronormative way is not the only way. Um, that societies around the world and through time have been structured. So again, manhood, womanhood, femininity, masculinity, those are cultural categories. They're not biological categories. They're social, structure, social structures that frame our understanding the way that folks interact. And I'm drawing here from um, an anthropologist, Mary Douglas, feminist anthropologist. Um, I found her work really useful. She's been very influential. She wrote in the, in the mid 60s, but her work's been very influential in um, understanding that, that these male female hierarchies are not, um, they're not, they may be related to biology, but they're not essential 
um, and that there's a lot of different ways to respond to gender and sex, even though those categories have um, a central place in most societies. I don't know if that makes sense, but I'm gonna unpack it a little bit more. So members of a society in any society tend to organize into patterns of some sort. And when something doesn't fit their pattern, whatever it is, whatever their pattern may be, the, and it's confusing to them or it contradicts the categories that they've set up, then they exert social pressures and, and the reasons for doing that is they're trying to protect their society. They're trying, trying to protect group co cohesion um, so that things will fit back into the categories that they've created. Um, and usually in any society, social pressures that are, again, they're being exerted by the group so the group can protect itself. Um, they, they're presented within the group as if these are laws of nature, these categories, you know, societies don't usually have any society not just ours doesn't have they usually don't have so much self-awareness that they'll say well these are just some cultural categories we constructed and meh, you know we can fix you could do that now that's going to be one of the options but most societies don't do that like most societies come at it as like this this is what our creation story uh, tells us and this is what we believe and this is what we've always believed and this is what our families taught us and this is so they'll present it like a law of nature um, and so when a cultural religion teaches that their ideas of sex and gender are natural they're reinforcing their own moral code it's not that those things actually are the only way to be natural in terms of sex and gender it's just that that's what's that's what their society teaches them as natural. I hope that makes it's a it's a maybe a fine distinction, but it's an important one. Anything that doesn't fall within that cultural religion's standard categories, which they created, but they don't remember creating them. Anything that doesn't fit their categories is interpreted as unnatural or immoral. So the religion and culture um, generally demand in any society. Again, it's not just ours. This is just how cultures operate. Um, they usually demand that this challenge to their categories be taken away, lessened or taken away. So I'm, I'm sharing all this as an LGBTQI person just to say that this has been immensely helpful to me and in other folks that I've trained um, to, to maybe make this a little less personal. So I'll just keep going. So the way that cultures and religions um, reduce or remove perceived threats to their cultural categories. It could be sex and gender, it could be any cultural category. They'll reinterpret something that doesn't fit. Now I'm gonna apply these to gender minorities because these, I think right now in our society when religions are really getting, um, when I say our society, I mean the US right now in 2020, right before a presidential election, okay? Um, so I should be specific, right now, uh, religious communities are very uh, riled up about gender minorities and an idea that their cultural categories that they see as natural and innate are male and female and they believe that's a moral natural law that's been created by a higher power the creator and um, that that's the only way to be, be. Um, so so if if they're willing to reinterpret the cat the person or the category what they might do is they'll say okay well this trans person is really a woman trapped in a man's body or you know they, these are the only two categories they have there's people there, you're whatever you were assigned at birth you were either male or female assigned at birth and that's all you can be so they want to hold the category so they have to reinterpret the person to fit the category so okay well you then you're a man wearing women's clothes or you're a woman that's trapped in a man's body in some way or um some whatever interpretation they can be could be a friendly <laughs> reinterpretation or it could be a an overtly hostile reinterpretation but the main thing that they're trying to do when they reinterpret is preserve their cultural category of male and female the main thing that they're trying not to do is threaten their firm clear categories by acknowledging that there could be some fluidity some transition some change some even intersexuality becomes a threat if that's if you have these binary categories that you think of as innate and if we if we don't 
have those two categories anymore, our whole society collapses or our whole religion collapses. Um, another method that, that societies use to reinforce their categories is of course physical violence. Um, and now here's one that of course I probably what leaps to mind is hate crimes against uh, gay people, pulse shooting, um, murders of, of trans women of color that are disproportionate, and any, anybody that's a gender or sex minority, but we know some groups get most targeted for those. Um, and I wanted to bring forward that physical control, physical violence also concern, um, includes things that are, may look more benign, but if we understand what they're doing in terms of these categories, so those unnecessary non-consensual surgeries on people that are born intersex, a little baby who has their sexual and reproduction productive organs taken away. A lot of intersex people were sterilized as infants. They'll never be able to have children. Um, why? Why was that done to them? Physical control, because you can't be intersex. We have to control your body, even your ability to have sex and, and have children as an adult. We're going to have to control that when you're an infant so that you don't grow up as an intersex person. We're going to physically control you and do violence to your body to make sure it looks like a binary body, that it doesn't violate our categories. There's absolutely no medical reason those surgeries have to be done to babies or children, especially with, you know, children without their consent, things that are gonna have a lifelong impact. All right, the third way of controlling people, or I'm sorry, reducing the perceived threats to the binary categories that some folks have about sex and gender is social exclusion. So my, we've talked about this in other classes, one class in particular on family acceptance. Um, when somebody doesn't fit the cultural categories, what we do, one of the one of the ways that's not overtly violent is, well, we'll just ignore you. You're not part of our family anymore. You're not part of our church anymore. We're going to pretend you don't exist. Um, we're going to ice you out. And then, of course, it could go all the way to harassment. So the the famous, you know, walking while trans. Uh, profiling by pro police even being arrested. Uh, trans women still report, frequent, especially trans women of color, be, having it assumed that they're sex workers soliciting for sex when all they're doing is just running errands or, you know, just walking with their friends. So walking while trans. Um, and then uh, another category, uh, I'm sorry, another way that threats are re removed or reduced is by labeling whatever and whoever doesn't fit in the cultural categories as dangerous. And that's really what this book, Purity and Big Danger, is actually all about. So when we label someone as dangerous, they're taboo, they're always in the wrong. This is still happening, of course, to gender and sex minorities. So when folks uh, claim that we're pedophiles or when they claim, you know, whatever it might be, they, the, the whole framing of gender and sex minorities as if we're all sexual predators. Um, it makes everybody scared of us. So of course we can't, especially for those of us who are gender minorities, for us to use a restroom or a locker room, a changing room, um, even for trans children to go to school, you know, uh, it's very threatening to folks feel literally scared. Folks who actually have power and are not in any way threatened, um, they're a lot less threatened than the trans folk that they're trying to exclude and control. but. But they feel endangered, and and it's this um, this social strategy that we don't really think about, but kind of it just happens. This is what how humans do group. This is how humans do culture. Um, and I'm only saying that because again, Mary Daly, Mary Douglas. Sorry, I'm thinking of a different feminist pioneer. Uh, Mary Douglas, you know, studied cultures all across the world and through time, and found these dynamics come up again and again and again, even though they were in different ways. And um, the categories of gender and sex themselves were, were different. They weren't always binary, but these dynamics always came up. So the last way, of course, is the one that in this program, most of us are, if not all of us, are really 
aiming at. So it's embracing and in integrating. So you don't have to treat people like they're dangerous. You don't have to control them. You don't have to reinterpret them and you don't have to exclude them. You could embrace them and you could integrate them into your categories and just say, oh, maybe my categories just weren't broad enough. Maybe I, maybe there's some, maybe we can add some new categories. Maybe we can stretch the categories. So, so of course there's, there's lots of other things we can do that we've been working on in the other classes. So I guess what I was really trying to get to is that sex and gender are very important in every society, but they're not this, almost every society, but they're not the same in every society. So we've seen that, especially when you looked at the, uh, the map of um, gender diverse cultures around the world. The ways that social groups include religious including religious communities enforce gender expectations are fairly ex predictable. So that's what we just went over, even though the gender roles themselves may differ. Um, so one of the things we want to look about it's, uh, this week is that a lot of times people in these social systems and religions internalize those social pressures we just talked about. And we tend to blame ourselves as if, you know, I'm a failure in my relationships, in my family, in my religious community for not being able to conform. Um, and we talked, if you took the human rights class, human rights and global advocacy, if you haven't taken it yet, I would really encourage you to take it. It's a great class. But there's a little bit more here about how, uh, um, actually it's from one of our lecturers in that class about human rights legislation around the world. Um, so he, he noted, that was this is Ryan Thorson from Harvard. He was sharing with us, for example, in more recent times, um, how, human rights, what we might call violations or denial of basic human rights to people who are sex and genders, my, minorities around the world, continues to be framed as a morals issue by, by governments that otherwise might be progressive about a lot of other forms of human rights. But when it comes to LGBTQI people, they'll say, oh no, this is, this is about moral decency and we have to protect the children. Um, and, and we find that, that cultures, societies, states, governments, they're still doing this primarily around issues of sex and sexuality, even when they don't, when they're progressive on other issues, if that makes sense. So again, I, I have Thorson's uh, observation here about this just kind of is reinforcing that again, these basic categories of gender and sex, people interpret them as um, really core to who they are as a group and get unusually protective of their group when issues of sex and gender come up. Again, I, I, I know I might be spending a lot of time on this, but one reason is um, I really hope that people will absorb, if they can understand that, that it's really not about if, if for example, if you yourself were a gender or sex minority, it's not your fault that people react this way. It's just what humans do when they pursue, perceive a group threat. We just see it over and over and over again in the past. Now, um, it, it's almost a reflexive way that human beings react around the categories of sex and gender. But there is hope, you know, that's what I was talking about before about the embracing and integrating. So we're working on something, but in the meantime, when people respond the way they do just to know that it's not your fault it's not um anyway maybe anything i can do to help folks not internalize that as much or that you can pass on to other people you know to, to help them not internalize it as much so when a community is attacked from outside of course the group often huddles and builds solidarity against the outside threat when a group's, a tr um, and I'm not going to belabor that because that's not really in this class, that's not really what we're talking about. When we're talking about religion, spirituality, and the way gender and sex minorities get treated, we're talking about a group feeling like, I'm not saying it's true, but they're feeling like they're being attacked from within. So the individual threat is singled out and punished in some kind of way. It might be by exclusion, it might be by violence, it might be by reinterpreting this person as whatever, oh, you just need reparative therapy, you're just a straight person who's confused, <laughs> um, whatever. The individual threat is singled out and punished 
or disciplined to publicly reaffirm the structure. And that's really an essential point. So when we look at re religious trauma, I really hope you'll hold on to that, that the, the public nature of those humiliations. For example, when I share my own story, it is absolutely ridiculous that that was in media around the world, but particularly it was in religious media around the world. Um, I'm a very private person. I was not a known person at all. And my work didn't get a whole lot of attention uh, before I came out. So, it, you know, it was not a matter of, my coming out was not a matter of worldwide significance. But what, what was done was I was publicly punished, humiliated. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But to reaffirm the structure, it wasn't about me. And this is why this work was tremendously healing for me. I'd read it in grad school, to be honest with you, but going on to teach, um, to teach this framework from Douglas and other anthropologists as I've gone on to teach gender studies and so on and so forth, um, it's been very, very healing because you know, to, being publicly humiliated feels very personal, but we gotta know that when this happens, what's happening is a person's being used as an example to reinforce the whole structure. Doesn't this person be ridic look ridiculous? How ridiculous is it to be um, a cisgendered straight female and claim to be a gay man? Why would you do that? That's ridiculous. Making fun of that person and, and showing how crazy they are reaffirms the structure. Our structure is good and normal. Normal, healthy people are cisgendered and straight. Now, hopefully you heard the irony in my voice or the sarcasm. <laughs> Again, I don't want to actually humiliate someone for holding this view either because uh, hopefully they're on a journey and they're just at a point in the journey where they're feeling really scared. Uh, and it's a somewhat reflexive reaction when we haven't thought through these things to feel scared and threatened by something new. Um, the point is uh, the group can kind of cause itself to collapse. Uh, because of these internal contradictions of having members that don't fit the categories and um, not being willing to integrate and include. So we're already seeing that, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, so basically, um, you know, I went through all this to say when we're talking about religions in this class, um, right now, uh, and and really since the AIDS crisis, really even before that, since homosexuality was, using the term, that's the word that was used at the time, when it was taken out of the American Psychological Association's Diagnostic Manual in 1972 or 1973, as it was no longer considered a mental illness, but as of 1972 or 1973, being gay didn't mean you were mentally ill. You could just be gay and be a healthy person. Um, that was really kind of the beginning of the religious pu pushback against gay people. And of course, the AIDS crisis really just brought it out into full, rabid hostility uh, in a really widespread way. So I just wanted to bring out that um, um, when religions of late are making sexual and gender identity politics their defining issue, which a lot of them seem to be for some reason. This may be why, because they feel their very group cohesion is, is, is at stake around these categories that they consider to be essential. So they're reinforcing the gender binary and heteronormativity. Um, and in doing that, we've talked about this in other classes, but that supports male supremacy. Um, where, where male privilege is subtle and contested. Okay, like so-called progressive societies. The pushback against anything that doesn't fit into these male supremacist category is actually more intense. I don't know if this makes sense, but the point that, that what, what scholars have found on this one is if you have blatant patriarchy and like we're just going to be right up front that males are privileged and women are don't have the right to vote or don't have equal rights to have lines of credit, whatever it might be. OK, so if it's blatant, 
we don't we don't even need to pick on gender and sex minorities because we're already we're already in a, a place where patriarchy uh, is is explicit and understood and there's really no wiggle room. However, when our society pretends to be one based on equality and oh everything's fine here, woman can do anything she wants, woman can do anything a man can do. But if it's actually underlying that surface level equality is actually patriarchal. We're pretending everybody's equal. I'm not going to name any particular society that does this, okay, but I, I'm going to use examples that you might be able to relate to. So we pretend everybody's equal. Everybody has the same voting rights, but some people get paid less than others for doing the same job. Um, people don't get treated the same way in the healthcare system as other people. Uh, people are not equally represented in terms of, in a democracy, uh, as who represents them. In other words, there's a disproportionate number of men. It's not 50-50 in houses of government, right? It's not 50-50 in, in, in positions of leadership. So there is patriarchy. That's, it's there. And it's not even that hard to see. But we're saying everything's equal and everybody has an equal chance. In a situation like that, cracking down on sex and gender minorities becomes more blatant, becomes more aggressive, because really the only way we can reinforce misogyny if we're not going to come right out and say women aren't equal is we can oppress everybody that's feminine or has the audacity to cross these invisible lines. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I hope it does. You can let me know in the discussion. Um, in patriarchal societies where women's independence or inherent right to be protected from overt physical control through violence is valued to at least some degree. Um, for example, in religious, progressive religious communities in the US and Canada, um, social pressures and that like we talked about before, those subtle ones like excluding people, it's not that subtle, but you know, they don't use physical violence, they're gonna to resort to those other things. They're gonna to resort to social exclusion, they're gonna uh, resort to reinterpreting. So we'll love the sin, but hate the sinner. That's a reinforcement of that social category. I'm gonna interpret you as a sinner, gender and sex minority, but you know, I'll love you, I'll practice my religion because I'm progressive, but you're a sinner. <laughs> um, so, so you know what I mean? So, so you're gonna use those, uh, not you, the group will use those other less violent forms of reinforcing their um, the patriarchy that they deny is part of their religious community, but is, um, and and that then and so those who are not cisgender, those who are not heterosexual males, um, get pushed down. They won't push down equally on cisgendered heterosexual women, but they're going to push down those other folks. And by doing that, they're reinforcing patriarchy without overtly oppressing cisgender straight women. I, anyway, okay, I know I've spent a long time on that. It's very subtle, it's not explicit, and the fact that it is so doggone subtle is why I'm spending a little more time on it. And when we look at that, this is all building a foundation for what we're going to do for the next four weeks. Um, so let's talk about not just general um, dynamics of cultures around sex and gender, but let's look especially at what's going on with LGBTQIA plus people. All right, so um, a specific form of this would be trans pathologization. And that's, for example, when, um, when medical providers, governmental providers, uh, political, you know, government policies and things like that, or even religions, um, interpret being a gender minority as innately mentally ill, deluded, disordered, sin, and that there's no way you could be a gender minority and live a healthy, happy life. Those are mutually exclusive things. We pathologized just being a gender minority. Um, so that's one example, right, of, of the way these categories get enforced by different communities uh, against um, gender and sex minority people. I do want to share, give you a heads up, as we're really going to see in weeks two, three, and, and four, um, not all religious communities do this to gender and sex minorities. So we're going to definitely get to explore 
a lot of really happier resources. But in week one, we're going to look at the problem. And then like week two, three, four is more like looking at solutions and options. Um, so one thing I wanted to say, again, we're talking about specific LGBTQIAA exclusion. Uh, when Christianity started to gain cultural influence around 2000 years ago, uh, various kinds of sexualities and gender expressions were accepted as normal in the ancient world. And you may be well aware of this. So in Greek and Roman cultures, part of male socialization was having same sex relationships. Um, and in fact, one of those is even uh, mentioned in the Bible, Jesus healed uh, the younger same-sex partner of a Roman centurion and praised the Roman centurion for his faith. Um, you know, it's a really beautiful story. Um, but, you know, that, that doesn't get really talked about in Christian communities. I kind of digress there for a minute. I wasn't going to cover that story anywhere in this class. But anyway, it's an example of the fact that in, in those ancient cultures before Christian Christianity took hold, um, and even in the beginnings of Christianity, I guess that's why I brought up Jesus and the Roman centurion. It was just part of life. It wasn't, it wasn't something that people got really stirred up about. Um, it was just, so it was one of those categories where uh, integration and embracing did happen. You, you know, they, uh, so hatred, fear, so where does it come from then? Hatred, fear, and censure of gender and sexual orientation diversity is relatively new. That's what I wanted to try to get get at. It's, it's, it's historically and culturally specific. It is not innate to any, it's not innate. <laughs> it's, it's relatively new. Um, and it arises really in Western medieval Christendom. It's not part of Christianity's beginnings. Like I just told you about the story of Jesus and the Roman centurion. I wrote a, I wrote an article about that, that cites sources. So if you want to look this up, I'm not including this as required material in the class, but it's called, um, gosh, what is it called? God hearts gays. Okay. You know, God, God hearts queers. It was in Huffington Post. All right. You know what? I'll just drop it in the discussion or something, but um, I'm trying to remember where that was. I want to say it was Matthew 8. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, I wasn't planning to bring that up and now it just seems relevant. And so like I should share it with you. So I'll just share it with you in a different comment. Um, so anyway, so currently, U.S. bullying of LGBTQI plus people isn't really about the teachings of any particular religious founder or holy texts, even though it's framed that way. That's what I'm trying to really get to. What it really is doing, because I just was sharing this about you with patriarchy in the last few slides, was what, in, what harassing LGBTQIA people is really about is about socially reinforcing male privilege. That's what it's really about. And you probably already know that. I know from our discussions, a lot of you are already really aware of this, but I wanna give you some more um, resources, okay? So that um, if anybody asks, you can share this information. In contemporary US culture, repeated use of gay slurs is part of male socialization. I definitely know that if you are someone that has been raised as male in this society, you probably are keenly aware of that. Uh, the bullying of any boys that appear to be different is part of uh, socially reinforcing hegemonic masculinity, toxic masculinity. Hegemonic just means it's, it's standardized. It's going to be you know, one form that this is what masculinity is. And if you, you veer outside this narrow category in any way, you're a threat. Um, so, you, as, as we all know, um, any boys or men that appear to be um, insufficiently masculine in appearance, clothing, and speech um, get bullied. And it's not really about the kid that's getting bullied, it's really about reinforcing that category. Because if we let one person slide and color outside the lines, then the whole category blows apart. And then, and then what? Well, that would probably be a good thing, but um, but folks are are scared, and they're not thinking all this consciously. It's just it happens. It's almost like reflexes, and it, it reinforces itself through this this bullying culture. Um, another thing that guys do is to talk about heterosexual conquests, whether or not they've had them. But all this talk about the all the sex they have 
supposedly had is supposed to prove it's it's flexing in front of the other guys again to reinforce the cultural category um and you know getting getting into you know my people the brutal bullying of trans women the murders of trans women um miss who are labeled as feminine men or men that are coloring outside the lines of toxic masculinity um it's it's that same pattern as the gay slurs of punishing somebody that's violated the category of, of masculinity in that narrowest sense so as you can see i've got some some sources there that you can look at further if you want to learn more about what scholars have said about that um the other thing i'm going to say i will not read all this to you but i encourage you to come back to it and if you're interested in it this is a wonderful article that's linked here on this but what i'm going to capture about this slide um i is is this is really sort of the the fulcrum of this issue really for lgbtq people in some ways or at least i feel like it is maybe because my body is intersecting with all these different categories but but it seems like as scholars have found the the excessive focus for example on intersex bodies and denying that intersex people exist and making sure that their intersex parts don't make it to adulthood um, it's really about ensuring heterosexual sex this is something that becomes essential to doctors in it's right after the puritan era actually but um but it really ramps up in the 19th and 20th centuries so the idea is if somebody's ambiguous then we can't be sure that the sex they have is heterosexual we don't know what parts they would use or how they would use them and there are many uh medical records of, of surgeries being done to um intersex people even in adulthood by doctors as if those are medically necessary specifically because they're worried about the kind of sex this person's going to be having and no other you know they wrote in those days they just wrote that at down and made it explicit so um whoops i see that i have a i have a typo on that um but anyway so so just be aware that um um yeah i, I use the term concern trolls here doctors and other experts have have posed as if oh we're really worried about this person being bullied or socially ostracized or what if somebody sees their body or no one will want them um and and so they they perform these surgeries on people um yeah there's a lot here there's a lot here to unpack but but i want you to see the interconnection between intersex bodies as dangerous ambiguous bodies as dangerous and um an overt explicit desire to make sure that there's no same-sex interaction happening um there's some other microaggressions that i wanted to just share as sometimes even folks that are progressives and allies are doing things that they may think are well-meaning but again they fall under those categories of reinterpreting someone's identity to them or um just other ways of kind of controlling gender and sexual identity um you can look at this yourself if you want to see it and it, it might be helpful to just um be aware of these so of course you i shouldn't say of course if you take another classes you're aware of this if you if you're new to our program and this is the first class you're taking i wanted to share that on nearly every continent i've alluded to this already in this lecture for all of recorded history thriving cultures have recognized revered and integrated more than two genders so the terms trans and gay um, they're not always categories that fit in a culture that already has three, four, five, six genders. Um, that those can those kind of are categories that are in themselves kind of binary in some ways. So there's lots of different ways of of talking about gender and sexual orientation identity. 
And there's a link here if you haven't explored the map of gender diverse cultures. It's something we really play with a lot in the trans affirming uh, gender identities class. But if you haven't had a chance to take that class, I would really invite you to explore that wonderful interactive map. Um, I did want to, uh, as we wrap up this lecture about building bridges and why we're doing it, I wanted to share a little bit about how LGBTQI a people see and experience religion in the United States in sort of a big picture kind of way. So from the Kinsey Report of the 50s, through studies of religious affiliation and so-called homosexual activity in the 1990s, scholars consistently have found in the US that gay people can be found in any religion. So the idea that you can't be both gay and religious, that's really what I'm addressing here for a minute. I wanna say that, there's no religious community that has avoided uh, producing LGBTQIA people, no matter what they might claim. There, we don't have any of them in our community. Every religious community um, has people within it who come out as LGBTQIA. Um, and then the other thing they found is that, that that's really no different from the general population. In other words, there's actually no more or no less LGBTQIA people that were really raised religious uh, than in the general population. In other words, yeah, I guess that's pretty clear, right? Um, so, so you're just as likely to be gay and lesbian if you were raised religious as if you weren't. Um, if you're raised religious, you're just as likely to have LGBTQIA uh, uh, people amongst you as you are in a non-religious setting. Um, so, however, homosexuality, uh, however, homosexual activity was reported less frequently amongst people who are more observant in terms of their religion and more frequently among those who are not. So what I'm trying to get to there is just sharing the only difference, if there's any difference at all, is that those of us in religious communities may feel, for whatever reason, we may internalize a message that um, acting upon our attraction you know, having a partner that we might be, we're, we're less likely to act on that. We're more likely to keep to ourselves and uh, not have a partner if we're in a religious community. So that's the only real difference. Another thing that's kind of interesting that among LGBTQIA people in the US, we actually have greater religious diversity than non-gay people do. So what happens is that, you know, a higher percentage of LGBTQIA people leave the religions they were raised in, but it doesn't mean that we stop being spiritual or religious. We usually affiliate with some other religion or spiritual practice that where we can be ourselves or where we can raise our families, where we can uh, have our, partner, our partners and our partnerships celebrated. Um, and we actually um, tend to be more active spiritually and in terms of religious affiliation than non-gay people in the U.S. So um, I think that's a very little known fact. That too comes from Comstock, and I'm going to show you right here. So there's the source. You can look at some of the sources that are cited here. Um, and there's a little a little chart that I copied out of that, uh, out of Comstock's book. And the book is Open, Affirming, Non-Repentant <laughs> uh, by Gary Comstock. <clears throat> anyway, um, so one of the things I wanted to address real quick before we move on is that when gender and sex diversity get, when we're, when we're told those things don't exist, that usually comes from a religious orientation. It doesn't seem, like folks deny that from like let's say a scientific or a secular perspective or a humanist perspective it's usually explicitly religious and folks will say something like aren't all people born either male or female don't they always stay the same sex and didn't god create them that way so again this is another reason building bridges may be important work because if we're going to get pushback as LGBTQIA people or allies of LGBTQIA people, it more likely is going to come from a religious perspective. So perhaps one of the things we can do is help people understand that human diversity is innate or created. If they're coming at it from a perspective that we're all created some kind of way by, by 
a higher power or whatever it might be, um, then maybe we can help them see, well, yes, okay, so people, if you believe that God created that person as they are, then just understand that God created them as that gay, trans, intersex person. In other words, that, that being gay or being intersex or being trans isn't something that most of us experience with. For most of us, and I know there are accept exceptions, so I'm not, I don't want to erase that, but for most people when, who are gender and sex minorities, they describe experiencing that as something that we've just always known about ourselves. Maybe we didn't have words for it, but not something that we chose. Uh, so maybe we can explore in terms of building bridges, how can we explain how these things are created? How uh, being queer, I'll just use it that way, or being a gender and sex minority can be connected with, I can say that I am that, and I can say that I was created that way, fearfully and wonderfully. Um, anyway, so again, I'm gonna quote one of our uh, uh, lecturers from the human rights class, Ryan Thorson from Harvard. He says that LGBT identities arise from sexual orientation toward partners of the same or multiple genders. They're distinct from trans identities, which are rooted in gender identity expression, or intersex identities, which are rooted in biological sex. In other words, he gives us some, he has some very simple language there um, to help, you, you know, one of the work, pieces of work we can do is, is help people understand even what these words mean. What is sexual orientation identity? What, what does that mean? What is intersex? I mean, a lot of the folks that are uncomfortable having gender and sexually uh, diverse people in their religious community, don't even know that there are differences between us. They don't know that we're not just choosing, we're not choosing um, behaviors or identities just to be provocative. <laughs> so getting, giving them some, some, some basic sort of 101 here, like Thorson does in such a helpful, succinct way of what are the differences, you know? Um, one of the things, that I wanted to show here is just um, what you're seeing on the side there is diversity. And uh, what I'm showing you um, up at the top, there is a graphic um, that just shows that all humans start out what we might call intersex. All of us start out um, with blended genitalia. And a lot of folks don't know this, but we all did. What you see on either side is the, the development of people when they're in the womb and people that are going over toward the left very gradually um, will start to have those undifferentiated blended genitalia start to take shape in more of a way that's usually associated with conventionally female biological structures, whereas starting at that point at the top in the center, that blended genitalia that start to develop over time, as you can see, it's gradual in the diagram. If they go over toward the right, they'll start to develop and continue to develop perhaps along what seems to be conventionally or what is assigned usually conventionally as male. But it's a gradual process. I mean, notice there's not a real big difference um, at the top of the chart there, um, not on the middle, but even when they're going in two different directions, they, they're still not that really that different. And someone who's intersex might sort of travel along that path and be a little bit more one way or the other, but not, not all the way to uh, those at the bottom. Those are shown at birth. Um, Yes, a lot, a lot of folks, most folks will go to one, uh, one side or the other there, but some folks will stay a little bit more in the middle. So, uh, you know, that may be a lot to absorb, but um, it might also be useful to remember that if we're talking about how people are created, uh, people are created intersex initially. And then I, you know, I share a picture of a, a butterfly there just to show how beautiful an intersex being can be. There are intersex creatures or gynandromorph is another term that's used in biology. Um, creatures in, in every species. And um, while in human circles, uh, a lot of medical and religious 
texts have called us freaks or rarities or monsters or disordered or whatever it might be when you look at something that is not human you can easily see the beauty in it i hope so um I, you know perhaps we interpret those who are different as ugly or monstrous to protect our cultural categories um because that's what humans do within our group but when we look outside of our group as something that isn't a threat to us, we can easily see that an intersex creature is quite lovely and not a threat at all and not dangerous. I don't know, this is a little bit more about um, development and I just actually wanted to kind of unpack for you. You don't have to look at this, but if you want to know a little bit more about the structures of the body that we, that we all have, that just look different on the outside as they develop in endosex people, or in other words, people who are not intersex. Um, yeah, we all have the same pieces and parts. They just grow and get shaped differently in most, most folks, but they're, they all, they're the same ducts and glands that just take different shapes and sizes. So again, um, you know, this idea of binary categories is it's, it's understandable why cultures come up with that idea, but it's not exactly correct, or it's not the whole picture. Um, another thing I would, I'm just going to share with you as we're just starting out is some common language. So sometimes when we're talking about gender diversity, I've heard people, even very well-meaning people, talk about trans folks or, or somebody as, as genetically female or genetically male. So again, because of intersex diversity, because of biological diversity, I just do want to share that um, there are more variations of the sex hormones than just XX and XY. You do not know, you do not know based on how someone is assigned at birth, what their genetic sex is. There's a lot of times someone may not know their own genetic sex for decades, particularly obviously if they have an intersex condition. So please do not assume that you know someone's biological, so-called by their biological sex or their genetic sex. A lot of people have undiagnosed intersex conditions. You don't know. And there are, as I was saying, there's, there's more variations than just XX and XY. And I give you more stuff about that on this slide if you're interested, but we won't go into that here. There's more vocabulary here again, just kind of making sure that, you know, if we're trying to build bridges, um, we want to stay away from microaggressions based on reinterpreting or misinterpreting somebody's gender. So this is just, this is more stuff that, um, it's real basic for people new to the conversation. Maybe this would be something to share. I cite the sources. This comes from the University of California's way of trying to help people in their community um, be more inclusive and more aware of diversity. So I'm gonna skip over that because I feel like in our, in our classes, we're pretty, this is pretty clear to most of us in our classes. So you can come back and explore this more if you want to. So I'm gonna just keep skipping that. What I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, for each of my lectures, I have a what's next slide. So we've just looked at how societies name and categorize sex and gender and that these are not actually innate, although cultures do enforce their sex and gender boundaries as if they're laws of nature. We've looked at some more evidence-based vocabulary now um, some of the stuff I, that I even skipped over as a common ground to move forward on this learning journey. So, um, so words are important and acknowledging the diversity and using the terms people use, that's going to be an important part of us, um, not inflicting more <laughs> trauma on people, uh, but building toward that engaging and integrating and embracing type of way of, um, broadening our categories. Uh, that that's a more healthy a more healthy society uh, is will be able to do that. So next we're going to look specifically at what some behavioral health experts describe as religious trauma syndrome. That's what I'm going to look at in the next lecture. What happens to gender and sex minority people when the categories and boundaries of their religious communities exclude them? We looked at it a little bit in structures of acceptance. If you took that class, 
but we're going to look specifically at some historical contemporary examples to understand where these conflicts arose in specific traditions that impact gender and sex minority people today. So we're going to actually take some time and instead of just looking at the broad categories like we did now, we're going to look a little bit at different religious traditions and, and where the little strains within each of them that have gender and sex minority exclusion, where those come from. Are they innate? Are they interpretations? Where they come from? Again, this is to equip you to help somebody that may be experiencing this, and that person may even be yourself. So if we understand maybe that these aren't uh, innate to every religious community, but there are, there are things that have roots in certain interpretations and strands, and we can just, you know, specifically focus on those. All right, that's all for now. Talk to you later.